All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get underway. Good afternoon again, everyone. It is so great to have you with us. We've got a great crowd from all around the country. My name is Dan Worry. I am the Director of Early Learning at the Hunt Institute. And we are here together uh, with three terrific guests to talk about early childhood philanthropy amidst COVID-19. Uh, I know it's going to be an important and a lively conversation. Uh, as a matter of housekeeping up front, I want to let you know that all of our participants today will have their lines muted throughout the uh, presentation. But we do plan to dedicate a, a pretty sizable chunk of our conversation today to your questions and uh, to having Q&A with our, our guests. So we do invite you to go ahead and insert your questions into the chat function there on Zoom, and we will pull those out in just a few minutes, and we'll uh, we'll pose those to our panelists. As we get started, I want to begin by uh, introducing you to my colleague, our president and CEO at the Hunt Institute, Dr. Javed Siddiqui, who's going to offer a few words of welcome. Thanks, Dan, and good afternoon to all, and thank you for joining uh, us during this unprecedented time, uh, as we continue to reflect on ways for us to have an impact, we thought this was a, another opportunity to launch a new series specifically around early childhood philanthropy uh, with uh, COVID-19 in mind. Uh, I, as Dan referenced, I have the good fortune of serving as the president of Hunt Institute named uh, affectionately after Governor Jim Hunt, four-term governor from North Carolina. We at the Institute serve as education policy support to governors, uh, state lawmakers, and other senior state electeds across uh, the entire country. We cover the full continuum from prenatal to early childhood education, K-12, and higher education. We've grown so much as an organization in this prenatal to five space, uh, specifically these last couple of years uh, as we ventured off. Uh, and trying to really make sure we were positioning ourselves to be a go-to call for the uh, electives we have a chance to interact with and support. Uh, and it's due in large part to our friends joining us today. Uh, so I obviously echo the thanks that Dan's offered to our guests and certainly having uh, somebody of Dan's uh, caliber and experience leading this work has been, has been critical to our building out our presence in this early childhood space. Uh, as we continue to work in the early childhood uh, area and continue to grow, we felt like this was a especially timely moment to hear from some of the field's most important philanthropic voices. Uh, so today we're very lucky to have three of them with us for this conversation and to answer your questions. So with that, Dan, I'll, I'll kick it back to you so you can introduce our guests and get our conversation going. Terrific. Thanks, Javed. And you're absolutely right. We are joined by uh, three of early childhood philanthropies, uh, certainly not only their most important funders, but most important thinkers, I think, as well. These are uh, Megan Wyatt, who is the Managing Director of Strategy and Programs at the Bezos Family Foundation, uh, Jerry Cobb, who is the Director of the Pritzker Children's Initiative, and Marika Cox-Mitchell, who is joining us from Washington, D.C., where she is the director of early learning at the Bainham Family Foundation. And we will, I think, probably uh, question uh, in, in that order to get going. Obviously, this is a really interesting uh, time to be having this conversation, as Javed mentioned. For those of us in the field, uh, you know, talking with uh, the field's major funders is probably always an interesting topic. It's great to know kind of what you are, are thinking and prioritizing during this time, but with COVID-19 continuing its rapid spread across the country and more recently uh, a renewed focus on racial equity issues that are facing not only our, our children and families, but really society at large, we felt like this conversation really was especially timely. So Megan, uh, Megan Wyatt of the Bezos Family Foundation. I'm going to kick things over to you to uh, to begin. And let me just ask you during this uh, during this unusual time, um, maybe you could share with us a little bit about what you and what the foundation are exploring and maybe re-examining during this time, and and maybe uh, any insights that you've you've called from that process so far. Thank you so much, Javed um, and Dan, for this opportunity. I'm really excited to kick us off. Um, as you noted, my focus at the Basis Family Foundation is on early childhood grant making and programs. Early learning is just a piece of what we do, but it's a really important aspect because early learning starts at birth, even before birth. Um, so maybe just as a really quick overview, we are a relatively small team of 30 based in Seattle with a small East Coast contingent uh, in New York and Kentucky. Our scope is national and it includes supporting learning from birth to high school. 
Our grant making in early childhood falls into three areas. One is child development and neuroscience research, and then moving that research into practice with an emphasis on the two really key relationships in children's lives, their parents and their early care and education professionals. And then the third area, which is our growing edge, is strengthening policy and awareness. I want to say that insights from early childhood research have informed everything that we do, in, including two foundation-led initiatives. Uh, the first is Mind in the Making, which joined us in 2015. It came with an over 10-year track record of sharing the science of executive functions, which are so important to children and adults' uh, success. And the second is Vroom, an initiative based on the tenets of Mind in the Making and the big opportunity we saw uh, was to inspire more of the behaviors between parents and children in the first five years in a way that's validating and aspirational because um, we know that those everyday moments can make a huge difference. Um, and so with that context, our priorities haven't changed, but what we are learning, the challenges and opportunities are really different. And so I wanna share a few insights. Um, the first, um, equity has always been a focus for us, um, but as we have worked to with other philanthropic partners, including those at the Early Childhood Investment Collaborative, to, in, to really push for a diverse and well-prepared and professionally compensated workforce, really making sure that the needs of diverse children and black and brown educators is really critical. Um, sy systemic racism, the disproportionate impact of this COVID-19 on black and brown children and educators has really brought uh, equity even more to the fore of our work. So that's the first point I wanna make. Um, the second thing that we're seeing more recognition and awareness of is mental health supports, not just for children, but for early care and educated educators themselves. Um, this includes, but is not limited to, trauma-informed care. And I want to give a shout out to our partners at the Loom Institute in Missouri that have been leading this work for some time and are seeing a huge surge in interest uh, for their training. We're also seeing just more need for educators to support and engage families directly. This is something that Vroom and Mind in the Making experienced right as, this, as the pandemic hit. And our programs had to pivot really quickly to provide content for parents. So whether that's stay-at-home tips or whether that is content to help parents turn challenging behavior, which I can really relate to as a parent of, of, of two young kids, into opportunities to promote learning. Um, we're also seeing uh, our, our partners out of sheer necessity experiment with online and digital delivery. Um, I, I imagine that many of our providers will long term end up with a more hybrid model and I think we're making some really good transferable insights about what works and what doesn't work um, with online delivery and I want to give a shout out to PrEP which is a prenatal intervention uh, based out of Columbia University in New York and Family Connects that I know many people on this call know well. Um, and finally, there's more research um, that I think is emerging out of this time. Uh, and specifically, I think we'll have a better sense of the kinds of supports and conditions um, that families were living in, um, the strategies they had that help them fare better and maybe not fare better during this time. And I wanna note specifically the Parent Corps program uh, out of NYU in New York City has been very focused on implementation of science and I really think is on a gold mine of data, um, understanding a lot about families, um, what they were up against and what's gonna get them through this period. So with that, I think my time is up. Thanks for letting me kick us off. Great. So Jerry, I'll, I'll turn to you and ask really the same question on behalf of the, the Pritzker Children's Initiative. What are you, what are you exploring and, and maybe re-examining during this time? Well, first I'd say ditto to everything Megan said. Um, a lot of what she talked about, we're hearing as well. And so it's exciting to hear what they're doing. Um, I'll try not to be redundant, but maybe a little bit. Um, so as you know, um, the goal of the Pritzker Children's Initiative is to expand services to at least 1 million low-income infants and toddlers and their families beginning prenatally. And that's the focus of all of our grant making and that hasn't changed at all. 
In fact, we were in the midst of expanding implementation grants focused on prenatal to three, just as the pandemic hit and everything began to shut down. So it's a scary time to be thinking about launching multi-year, multi-million dollar grants in 20 states focused on advocacy and policy and increased state appropriations. When state budgets are being decimated, childcare is shut down in a way that we've never seen before. And parents are afraid to even go to the doctor to get well child visits and immunizations. Um, we're in this for the long term though, so we didn't want to back off on our investments, but we certainly did pivot in some instances. Um, our biggest emphasis is on wanting to capitalize um, on what is occurring, to learn from it, and to build the system back better than it was before versus restoring the flawed system that had been in place that we all wanted to change anyway. So we went to our state grantees and asked them if they wanted to pause um, with very few exceptions. They all felt like the time was now and definitely didn't want to delay their grants. Um, they did see some opportunities for policy change. And they also knew they were going to need to play both offense and defense right now to assure some of the gains they had made previously weren't rolled back as a result of the pandemic. Um, we've made grants in 20 states focused on prenatal to age three and feel like that we're funding the infrastructure in those states that's going to support early childhood planning and advocacy at both the state and the federal level. So for those on this call that are working at the federal level or in any of our funded states, think about how to use that infrastructure that's being developed um, and strengthened and how your priorities fit with the work that they're doing to move forward a prenatal to three policy agenda. These are very comprehensive and large coalitions they've created and they're comprised of a cross-sector group of stakeholders at the local and state level. They're working on child care, health and development, supports to families, and their focus is advocacy for policy change and increased investments. And as we've all seen, business leaders and policymakers are finally beginning to understand the essential need for child care if the economy is to fully rebound. They finally see child care as an essential service, although it's still not clear that they're willing to pay for it. Um, and even as we advocate for new child care dollars, our worry is that advocates are still only focusing on building back the system we had and not calculating the dollars that are needed to rebuild a system that is better than the one we had one that assures that there is an adequate supply of affordable, high quality child care for all families, and particularly building the supply of infant toddler care, given the huge um, lack of, of such care in so many communities, even before the pandemic. And of course, paying providers adequate compensation for the work they're doing. Um, we're also, also focusing, focusing on things like home-based child care, increasing that supply and quality, working through um, the homegrown initiative, um, and thinking also about what parents need right now and in the future and supporting the pivot to virtual home visiting, telehealth, and thinking about how we assist in areas like maternal depression at this time. The other thing we're really seeing right now is the impact in states that already have statewide local infrastructures in place, like Smart Start in North Carolina, First Steps in South Carolina, First Five in California, Smart Beginnings in Virginia, local early childhood initiatives across the country, Iowa, Colorado, and Michigan. Um, in these states, they already had a local infrastructure focused on coordination and support for young children and families. So when the pandemic hit, they already were set to coordinate a response that was customized to the needs of young children and families in their communities. They could have a more customized response as to what was needed to maintain and sustain and build back child care. And they could pivot to a more coordinated response on home visiting and supports to families to assure they got the resources they need. So as we think about our goal of building back better, how are we going to better support those local community efforts? That's where children and families are and they know much better at the community level as to what's needed and how to customize their response. States have that, local, that have that local infrastructure in place already are in much better shape now than those who did not. And we're continuing to prioritize an approach that assures that we're thinking very intentionally about strategies that particularly target children and families of color. Often they are the ones most likely to get left out of the services they need. We're asking our states and communities to think very strategically about approaches that get very intentionally to the need to reduce the disparities among our children and families of color. So I'll stop there, um, but hopefully it gives you a general idea of what's going on. 
Terrific. Thank you, Jerry. And so, Marika, we'll turn to you uh, on, on that, that same question. You want to give a little overview of the Bainham Family Foundation and, and what you're thinking about right now? Sure. Um, much like Megan and Jerry, we've been, our focus has not changed. We've always been focused on early learning in Washington, D.C., both policy, making sure that we have the policy conditions in place to create a more equitable and sustainable early learning system, ensuring that young children and families, and particularly infants and toddlers, have access to high quality services and programs, and of course, using research to drive all of those decisions. So early learning research policy and practice in the District of Columbia has been our focus, and that focus um, has not shifted. Um, COVID has caused us to rapidly adapt so that we can thrive, um, and we see our partners in the communities doing that well. Um, they've been, we've been focused on leveraging their expertise, frankly, I think there are times where philanthropy sometimes get in the way of innovation. And um, what we've been focusing on is actually getting out, out of the way of um, programs. We have partners who know their communities well. We have partners who are really um, focused on human-centered design. They have established relationship with the families they serve. They have the expertise. And our role has been to give them all of the resources, flexibility, um, and autonomy that they need to adapt, quickly adapt, um, so that they can thrive. And they've been doing that well, whether it's um, transitioning to an online platform or virtual family engagement or Facebook Live story time or um, serving as um, a diaper hub or a food hub for, for, for families, or checking in with families, um, their social emotional well being, leveraging additional resources in the community, as well as our policy partners who, again, knowing the community well and having the expertise to use this as an opportunity to increase um, public awareness about the inherent gaps in the child care system and how the pandemic has even worsened the gaps, um, expanding their advocacy base and the cadre of advocates who are available and, and willing to support um, the work. So we've been, again, adapting um, to make sure that we can thrive post-pandemic, um, um, as well as thinking ahead to what the new child care system could potentially look like. Um, frankly, our communities have always told us about those gaps. The gaps aren't new to us. Uh, the pandemic has just given us a bigger platform, a wider audience who, are, who can now help us um, uh, address the gap. And so we've also been thinking ahead to how do we build the childcare system better? How do we leverage this opportunity to build it better um, with the uh, more audiences looking at child care. We have families at home who are really understanding now what it means to be an early childhood educator <laughs> um, as they navigate Zoom with um, kids in the background. Um, and, and so that's the space we're in right now. I'm giving much autonomy and flexibility to our partners that innovate and, and, uh, and stepping back so that we can actually document their innovation and highlight the, highlight the innovation. Um, another thing we're doing, um, it seems relatively <laughs> minor, but for philanthropy, it's, it's major. We're giving, we're reducing the administrative burden for um, programs, um, and we are not uh, asking them at this time for significant um, reporting to the foundation. Again, all focus on giving them the space and time they need to do what they do best, which is serve their, their families. Great, thanks so much, Marika and, and Megan and Jerry for those those uh, introductory comments. We're gonna begin our Q&A here in just a moment. Uh, I'm gonna kick off with maybe a question for each of you, and then we're gonna turn to the questions that are already uh, starting to pile up in the, in the chat. I see we've got four or five already. If you have a question that you'd like to post, please do uh, feel free to plug it there into the, into the Q&A. And if it is for someone in particular, by the way, please do note that, otherwise we'll, we'll sort of throw it open to the entire panel. Um, the other thing is that our panelists have asked today if there's an opportunity to make this sort of a conversation uh, with you. Obviously, you're hearing from them, but they want to hear from 
from you as well. And so we invite you in the chat today to uh, give some thought uh, to the question of what are the priorities that you think are, are most important uh, for early childhood philanthropy to be focused on at this time? And we'd love maybe we can uh, sort of synthesize some of that later on in the, in the conversation. The other thing I wanted to mention to you if you are uh, continuing this conversation on social media, we invite you to use the hashtag, hashtag ECWebinar uh, to, uh, to help us keep track of, of all the great conversations that are happening. So Megan, you know, one of the things that I know is a, a, a real priority for the Bezos Family Foundation is improving access to rich early learning opportunities, but you know, as as Jerry mentioned here, some of the some of the challenges that are happening right now, you know, states have had widespread closures uh, in childcare. It is reopening at limited capacity in in lots and lots of states. We've got state budgets that are uh, you know just sort of dropping off the cliff, and they're looking at you know, across the board cuts, which, you know, I think we are we're all collectively fearful could impact things like, like pre-K and our state public private partnerships and in early childhood. So it appears as though there's a real danger of access actually sort of contracting um, at this point. So curious to know from you, what, what solutions do you see uh, in terms of being able to help us to preserve that access? And in particular, maybe being able to preserve access in a way that, that supports equitable access for, for young children of, of color? I think that is the right question to be asking. I mean, we're in a period of major disruption I think all of us have to be optimistic that something good will come out of it. I really appreciate how my colleagues have used the term build back better. I think there are things we know and are really clear about. I think there's aspects of your question that are emerging and we really don't know yet. Um, what we do know is that we need more data and better data about quality and access and the gaps. And so I want to highlight a, part, a longstanding partner of ours, Child Care Aware of America, that has been deep in mapping and gap analysis and putting more information online so we can really understand where the needs are. So data is going to be super important. Um, the second thing that I'm really clear on is that building back better has to involve all of us. I mean, I think for too long, the issue of funding early care and education, the burden has been placed on early care and education providers and the early childhood sector. And as my colleagues have mentioned, and as everyone is acutely aware, it's the backbone of our economy, um, in addition to being a driver of child development. And so this issue is way bigger than us on this call. Um, this is an issue that is going to require investment and prioritization from other sectors as well. So really clear about that. Um, you know, as sort of relatedly, um, there's a really important local aspect of mobilizing for funding and quality. We've seen some really interesting and promising activity through the Raising Child Care Fund. Um, standing up organizations um, that are representative of parents, of early care and education providers with a real social justice orientation. And so more mobilization, more local commitment, I think is going to be important. Um, you know, the concern that we have, and I know I'm not alone in this concern, um, is what will happen to the small business providers um, for whom the economic model didn't make sense before and is, is really at risk. Um, and so as we, as I had articulated, I think the policy and system levers are our growing edge. It is something that we intend to focus more on as a foundation. It was a big reason um, why we partnered with Hunt. And I know you all are planning um, a series of supports and events to really help systems build that better, as Jerry said. Um, and so as we, you know, lean into the discussion part of this webinar, I'm really eager for insights and opportunities that my colleagues in the field are seeing on this issue, because um, I think we're not quite at solutions yet. I hear a lot about Connecticut. I know that there are, are bright spots in states, um, but we have a lot of work to do. Definitely do. Thanks, Megan. 
Jerry, let's let's turn to you. You know, the, the Pritzker Children's Initiative obviously is really laser focused on, on prenatal, the three in particular, uh, and the needs of, of those, um, those families. In your conversations with your grantees or, around the country, you know, you're working with states to expand access. What are you hearing about the, maybe the unique challenges of, of families with children in that, in that age range? And you know, to this question of rebuilding the system better, um, you know, are there innovations during this time that you're seeing that um, you know, have been helpful now and maybe would be things we'd be wise to continue moving forward? Yeah, great question. Um, so a, a few things in response um, to, first of all, if you haven't seen this, I, I'm happy to send the link, but the University of Oregon is now doing a weekly survey of families across the country to regularly understand what they're dealing with and what their needs are. And they're structuring it in a way to help states and communities think about what families need and to advise policymakers on changes they should be making. They put out a report every week and it's just chock full of great information that can help you think about um, what you're doing and what you need to do differently as well. Um, so if you haven't, if you aren't getting um, those reports, let me know and I'm happy to send them the link. They post them online every single week. Um, on the home visiting side, there's been a huge pivot to virtual in order to respond to the needs of families during this period. 3,000 people are joining weekly calls to learn about um, effective practices and a virtual approach to home visiting. And what we're hearing is that home visitors are reaching families that they couldn't reach before, who weren't comfortable with the idea of a stranger coming into their home. And the cat's joining me. <laughs> But they are desperate for support right now, these families, and having a home visitor meet with them via video or phone is a big help right now. So we're funding research during this period to understand what works and what doesn't work in a virtual approach to home visiting with the idea that this can inform the various home visiting models and in incorporating virtual components going forward. We also hope the research will condense Medicaid official, officials as to why virtual home visiting should also be equitably funded. Um, states are seeing that well child visits and immunization rates are falling at an alarming rate during this period and they're strategizing as to what they need to do now and in the future to get these numbers back up. In North Carolina, they've gone to the feds and requested a waiver on their child health insurance um, program funding to allow them to support statewide expansion of Reach Out and Read as a strategy to better support families and get them into the pediatric offices for their well child visits and immunizations. Um, and that brings up another issue we're hearing that while the medical profession in general is being supported during the pandemic, pediatric providers are particularly being hard hit and aren't getting the same level of support. And families aren't coming to them for appointments and they're struggling to just deal with, with what they need to do differently. It's another reason why this North Carolina strategy around Reach Out and Read is such a good one. But every state needs to really be thinking about this and what you need to do to sustain your pediatric providers. They're the ones on the, the front line of health and development for our young children. And particularly when you think about the lack of of pediatricians in the poor rural areas um, and, and what you need to do about that as well. You certainly want to sustain the ones you have. Um, on the child care side, we've been supporting the development of emergency funds for home-based child care through Homegrown. Um, and the numbers of home-based child care providers have been sliding downwards for years. Um, but that is now going to change as a result of the pandemic. Um, everyone sees the opportunities now of utilizing home-based child care providers. But while we're thinking about a home-based child care strategy, we've also got to be mindful that we don't want to throw out regulation and quality in the interest of creating a bigger supply of child care. We've got to build back child care that is high quality and meets our health and safety regulations too. And we have to think about costs. Some states and communities are pivoting to creating more shared services alliances and staffed family child care networks that create some economies of scale for center and home-based child care. But we also got to think about the overall cost of that care when we're putting new financing into place at the state level. So you don't want to just fund everyone at the same percentage level. It just doesn't make sense. Louise Stoney at Opportunities Exchange has been crunching the numbers in several states. And what she finds is that when you look at the cost of care at minimum licensing standards for infants and toddlers and three and four-year-olds, 
And what you find is that the subsidy reimbursement for infant toddler care still doesn't cover the cost of care. While for three and four year olds, and this is minimum licensing I'm talking about, they're making a profit, which of course they should make a profit. Um, but infant and toddler care is operating at such a deficit. And then when you crunch the numbers for higher quality care, it's pretty horrifying. The cost goes up significantly for infant toddler care and the gap between that actual cost and the subsidy reimbursement rate just widens. So those providers of infant toddler care are operating at a big deficit. And that's not the case for those providers only serving three and four year olds. So when these providers are determining whether they should reopen or stay open, why would they wanna be going into a deficit by offering care to babies and toddlers? Why wouldn't they all just be offering care for older children? It just makes good business sense. So when you're thinking about how you break up subsidy payment rates, every single state better be thinking about how they boost payments for infant toddler care substantially above what they've been paying, or there will be no more care available for babies. And I'm pretty sure we need those parents going back to work as well. Um, going back to what I'd said earlier around community networks and the priority of those as well, um, in Pierce County, Washington, they learned from a healthcare provider group that they had access to baby formula and the local Help Me Grow leaders figured out how to create a central distribution point to share those resources. Washington state leaders are now seeing that Help Me Grow can be the mechanism they use in all of their communities statewide to reach out and support families in a more intentional way. And that only happens because you have that local infrastructure, in this case through Help Me Grow. But North Carolina and, and other southern states, when they're going through hurricanes, it's the same story. Um, the local Smart Start partnerships in North Carolina, when there's a big storm with a lot of damage during reconstruction, they're there um, helping coordinate the support to children and families um, after the devastation of the, of the, the storm. Um, so it's just another, another reason to really highlight those, the importance of those community networks and how we utilize them and strengthen them going forward as well. That's really exciting. I mean, to to think that during a time that that we you know we could have seen you know home visiting, for example, really contract because of uh, you know lack of access to families. To know that there are you know parts of the parts of the field that are that are thriving and growing under these uh, circumstances. I mean, really gives us some hope for, th for things that we could do um, going forward as well. So thanks, Jerry, for, for sharing all of those great examples. Uh, Marika, before we, before we jump in, I want to, with, with all the, uh, the Q&A uh, questions, I want to throw a question out to you as well. You know, you um, are, are, are so well known as, as sort of an authority on the early childhood workforce. I am uh, curious to know, you know, as you're talking with grantees, uh, you know, both there in the DC area and sort of monitoring the situation um, nationally, what is the what is the pandemic meant for the for the early childhood workforce, and and what do you see um, maybe coming out of out of this time uh, in terms of where we go next with them? I mean, I see several things. Um, one is the recognition that early childhood educators are essential worker workers with very specialized competencies. Um, so that's been um, very part of the dominant conversation is definitely uh, being part of the conversation with a much wider audience than what it was prior to the pandemic. Um, that we continue to see that early childhood educators, um, particularly black and brown early childhood educators, continue to be systemically excluded from decisions about their work, their work, um, their compensation, the resource distribution, and so as we think about plans to uh, build it better or as we think about adaptation, including make, making sure that early childhood educators um, from both centers and homes are part of those conversations um, is really important. Um, we've seen many reopening committees, uh, policy recommendations coming out um, and making sure that those recommendations are being driven by the early childhood educators themselves will be really important um, as we look at compensation. Um, we need to continue to focus on compensation to ensure that those early childhood educators are able to come back to childcare when we reopen. Um, and um, for many of them, compensation is gonna be a, a non-negotiable, um, particularly as we look at the ones who were able to get some unemployment benefits. If your unemployment and your salary is pretty much the same, or in some cases, your unemployment 
uh, benefits um, or in cases higher than your salary, that definitely poses a challenge for childcare centers who are trying to reopen and trying to attract teachers into their classrooms. Um, again, looking at the pipeline, the recruitment and retention issues in, in early childhood education, we have an aging population. And um, just some of the preliminary data shows that they may not be willing to come back and risk their health to do this work. Um, so how do we continue to make sure that we have a, a recruitment and retention strategy in place where we're not only retaining our current early childhood educators, but we're actually bringing new um, educators into the pipeline. And again, this is all settings. And as we look at all settings, including family child care, recognizing that we're going to have to pivot the strategy and customize the workforce strategy for each, um, each sector. As well as looking at the working conditions, we often don't talk about working conditions when we talk about the early childhood workforce. Certainly salary and competencies uh, dominate the conversation, but so does working conditions. We're seeing early childhood educators um, asking very intentional questions about their working conditions, um, their me own mental well-being, because they now have to come back to, um, to work and support young children. Very, the, the emotional and social development of young children and they're asking questions about their own well-being and what resources they're going to have in place to be able to do that and while it's their their safety as well and um so many of the conversations around the workforce just has been that opening child care the way we did before does not necessarily mean you're going to have early childhood educators walking in the door. They're going to be asking more questions again about their compensation, their working conditions. Um, some may not even come back as we're losing, potentially losing childcare, we could also be losing members of the workforce. That's great. Thanks, Marika. We're going to go ahead and try to jump in. We've got, uh, by my count, 20 minutes and about 29 questions so far. Uh, so we'll have to be, uh, we'll have to be relatively uh, quick on on, on some of these, but um, we'll go ahead and throw some out. So interesting question here right off the bat, um, and, and I'll throw it open to all, all three of you. Do you see any opportunities for philanthropic partnerships with employers uh, right now to help to pilot and scale early childhood development efforts, and how might that be done so that we uh, advance or at least don't lose uh, kind of the growing public will around early childhood as a public good? Anybody want to? way in there. You'll have to unmute yourselves. I am a teacher at heart. I will call on you. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think um, it's a delicate balance. I think definitely employers can play a role, um, particularly on the sort of the economy, economic recovery. Um, businesses will need uh, to pay attention and invest in childcare as part of the economic recovery strategy. And at the same time, being very careful about not positioning early childhood education in early childhood educators as only um, valuable to society to help families work. So I think definitely, I think many, a lot of employers are paying attention to early learning. We can definitely leverage them and their resources. And at the same time, being very cautious about not presenting early childhood education as only a workforce productivity um, resource. Right. Uh, another question, COVID-19 has presented a major opportunity for legislative change around childcare. Are there ways that you are uh, thinking about this and anything in particular that you'd point to um, that, uh, that maybe you'd like to see done to drive a change in that direction? I mean, I mean our, all of our states are working on, on different agendas. I think everybody worries a little bit about COVID and the need, the desperate need to get child care providers um, up and working again is also going to drive de deregulation and um, to push back the quality requirements that we've all worked so hard to make happen. So there's the need to play defense on that. I think people see that um, there are more resources coming into child care, but then how do you use them in a way that's most strategic um, so that you're building back better child care and not just building back any child care as well to really think strategically about that too. 
Right. I will say, I'm, uh, as, as I'm scrolling through the, through the questions, there are lots of uh, questions and lots of interest, Jerry, in the, uh, the Oregon surveys that you, that you mentioned. So um, what maybe we could do, I'll, I'll connect with you maybe, Jerry, um, after, and let's see if maybe through our, uh, through our social media accounts we can't um, push out some of the some links, to, links to information there if it's, if it's available publicly. Yeah, and anybody that I've seen the questions on that are asking for the link, I'm putting it in to the answer right. as well. So hopefully they're seeing that too. I'm so right. happy to share it for us to get it out in a bigger way. So here's an, an interesting question from, uh, from Cindy. As we think about rebuilding a better and stronger system, what considerations are people giving to buildings themselves, to the physical infrastructure uh, that impacts quality and access uh, and health and safety. We know, you know, going into uh, COVID-19, there was a real crisis, you know, and, and I think maybe as, as sort of an unfolding crisis right now with the limited, uh, you know, limited capacity to, uh, to reopen the limited group sizes. Lots of centers don't even have the you know, they just don't simply have the physical capacity to double the number of, uh, of rooms that are available, for example. So, um, you know, reopening is, is requiring some major renovations in some places. Um, but uh, Cindy is noting that there, the resources to support that kind of work remain very scarce. Any, any thoughts here? I think some innovations we've seen in the district um, is leveraging public schools and actually having childcare centers or early learning programs in public school. In some cases, public schools have more space. And so having that birth through age um, eight pipeline in the public schools, we've been seeing um, that in the district. Um, I think it's also important to give programs sort of the flexibility. So we um, will soon be releasing many grants to programs to help them reopen and giving them the, instead of prescribing exactly what they use those resources for, we predict that we're going to see some actually try to expand their space and, and reconfigure their space so they can serve more children. And so I think when it comes to the building, I do think that philanthropic organizations tend to shy away from that. And I think the more we provide flexibility to early to the partners we support to make decisions based on their priorities, I think we'll see more innovation. I think this is now is the time to innovate. Now is not the time to micromanage and prescribe how resources are used. So to the uh, to the workforce uh, question earlier, Charles has uh, has framed this nicely. It says many of the heroes of the pandemic have been in the helping world, right? For young kids and childcare and home visiting and pediatric care and community health, uh, all generally underpaid professions, particularly in in childcare, um, you know, and and. Um, professions where, where, you know, those employees are often struggling to raise their own kids. How do we use the recognition of these helpers who are now being kind of recognized in some cases as first responders, um, you know, for the, for the first time? How do we um, use recognition of those helpers uh, as essential to our society to make more public investments that really invest in, in supporting them um, as a resource uh, and in terms of their value to society going forward? Jerry, are you going to talk? I knew. Well, no, if you jumped in, I was just going to say that I, zero to three has always done such a great job of lifting up the voices um, of families and providers as as part of the work they do and telling those stories. And I've always found that to be so compelling and in getting that message out to legislators. But you probably have a lot more specific examples, Megan. So go for it. No, I I think recognition is critical. Um, but long term, it's it's really recognizing the value of the profession um, that early care and education providers are providing to children and their families. And so this is sort of a longer term play that we're involved in with the Early Childhood Educator Investment Collaborative to really transform how we even think about preparation. It's a workforce that's going to probably turn over because of this 
because of this pandemic and bringing different kinds of content, child development. Uh, this is something that Mind in the Making has been working on for over a year, ensuring that the, the preparation process includes the latest science on child development, but that we are also incentivizing institutes of higher ed to think differently about preparation in ways that work for the providers themselves, who may be parents, um, and incentivizing states to really address the, the pay parity issues. Um, and so I appreciate the question, the recognition is critical, but it really is about professionalization and valuing the contribution of the workforce. And that's, and that's a longer term endeavor, but one that I think we feel an increased sense of urgency to address. I think the increased, increased recognition is definitely important and needs to be leveraged. And at the same time, we need to add that um, recognition without compensation is meaningless. And so how do we pivot from and leverage the recognition to move into a space where we're making a stronger case for increased um, compensation? Terrific. Great I'll question. That. Oh. question from Liz, who is asking about how uh, the foundation's work is helping to address racial disparities in maternal and infant health. Uh, in particular, which is one of the places, you know, based on the data where where those disparities are just really glaring across the country. Any any of the three of you working on, on that topic in particular? Do you want to talk about what you're doing, Megan? Or I can, what I can say is that um, where we have a number of states who are particularly prioritizing maternal and infant health, mental health as part of the work they're doing and, and have very specific strategies about it. I can't go any more into any more detail than that, but it definitely is a huge priority and certainly as part of the pandemic. I was gonna save this for the end, so you'll have to hear it twice. <laughs> um, <laughs> But really looking at the prenatal period and that transition to parenthood, both the infant well-being and the, the whole family well-being um, is a priority for us. We have kicked off uh, a, a piece of research looking at who the experts are um, and some of the promising community-based models. They've been around for, for a long time uh, that support parents and families during that transition. Uh, and we really see this as the next frontier. Um, this is where health and development, parent for the child are so inextricably linked, um, but the solutions have been siloed. And so this is something that uh, we're gonna be more deeply investing and in working in going forward. Great. We've got a, a couple of different questions that maybe I can kind of pull together um, related to family child care. You know, the, the data suggested that the family child care was, you know, prior to the pandemic um, was dropping off in very significant numbers and, and now has sort of stepped in to, to play a, a pretty significant role. In fact, there was an article, I want to say, was it in the Boston Globe here this week, um, that was, was sort of speculating around whether the entire market would now be shifting to more home-based care and away from, from larger group-based care. Um, are, there, are there particular supports that you see as essential right now uh, for family-based childcare? Um, so I can say that um, there's a funder collaborative called Homegrown um, that is specifically focused on home-based childcare. Um, and doing fantastic work across the country. Um, and their whole focus is around, and this was before COVID, but how do you um, strengthen the supply and quality of home-based childcare and how do you craft policies that particularly support that? Because you're absolutely right. It's the numbers have been dropping significantly for years. And for the Pritzker Children's Initiative, we're so focused on um, prenatal to three, and we know that's where babies often are, where families feel most comfortable putting their babies is in home-based child care. Um, so as part of the Homegrown Initiative, one of the things they've done as part of COVID is to create um, opportunities for emergency funds around home-based child care. 
Um, and so and I'm happy for anybody who would like to make a connection to the work they're doing. I think they have established um, emergency funds for home-based home -based child care in about 20 states at this point. They're partnering with local and state foundations um, and other organizations to help get those emergency funds up and running. Um, so happy to make that connection for anybody who wants to know more. And I think what we're seeing with um, home-based childcare is certainly providing the resources to help them to help retain and help them reopen, but also giving them um, space to actually inform the decisions about their work. I think um, often they're not at the policy tables at all. The policy decisions are made or the resources are distributed and then we call the family child care and i think we're as we're trying to flip to this human centered design and trying to support innovations we've been finding ways both um with our practice work as well as the policy work to make sure that we're we have the early the home base programs their representatives as part of the decision making and not a recipient of the decisions we've made so just flipping the hierarchy is where we also focus in addition to providing uh, emergency funding well, let's circle back to the, you know, we, we, we threw out the question about what philanthropy might be prioritizing um, during this time. Andrea had an interesting comment. She says, in, a, in an environment with increased scarcity, do you have suggestions for encouraging philanthropy to fund new programs that might change the system uh, while other, well, you know, many local funders are focused uh, very much on supporting existing programs? That's probably a, a tension that, you know, all three of you kind of work through, I would imagine, uh, you know, as you're, as you're considering grantees, this question of sustaining things that, exi that exist and are successful versus uh, innovations in the, in the system. Any, any thoughts there? I mean, we've, um, we've tried to look at what we are funding and um, how we support it going forward, but in a way that, that learns um, and takes advantage of the experience we're having now. So the, um, the work around virtual home visiting is a great example of that, where we do support home visiting. We think it's essential in creating a prenatal to three system. Um, it, it is, it has gone virtual for the purposes of the current situation we're in, but what can we learn from it so that um, once we get to whatever the new normal is, what have we learned from this experience with virtual home visiting? How can we incorporate that into the models that um, are already in place and, and learn from what works and what doesn't work so that that strengthened going forward? Um, so that's an example of, of where we tried to um, to learn and support to new activities that we wouldn't have, but it's about building on what our current priorities are anyway. Terrific. We are uh, we're getting down close to the to the end of the hour, and so it, it concerns me. There are so many so many questions. I might invite Megan, Jerry, and Marika if you've got even even five minutes after the uh, after our time here today. If you um, you know, please feel free to. Um, to go in, I know Jerry. It sounds like you've been doing it even uh, even throughout here. But if we, if you want to um, even type in some short answers in the in the chat to some of these questions, it'd be it'd be great. But I know um, you know we had talked about kind of a, a closing question that I know you've given some thought to. So I wanted to at least throw that out uh, before we wrap up today, and that relates to the opportunities that you see right now. What are the what are the main opportunities you see for reimagining a more just early childhood landscape that addresses really some of the structural issues that we're, we're seeing today. Jerry, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so we, as part of all of our work, we've always tried to emphasize that we want to reduce racial disparities and not increase them. And the current situation we're in just highlights that. And as we think about building back better to think very intentionally and strategically about how to assure that we're reaching children and families of color and working to assure that we're decreasing those ethnic and racial disparities and not increasing them. Um, and really thinking from a perspective of disaggregated data as part of informing our decision making and our very strategic approaches to policy and, and program implementation. 
Um, and, you know, we're going through these budget cuts now. Everybody's going to be going through them. And so to be just the strategic about the cuts as well, not to simply make cuts across the board, but, think, but to think about where the greatest needs are and which communities and families have been impacted most significantly. So to, to take a scalpel to your budgets um, and not a hammer. Um, cuts are always going to be painful, but do them in a way that assures that those with greatest need are being supported. Um, and so when you crunch the numbers, you know, we always talk about all universal approaches, everybody's going to be supported. The reality is in universal approaches, it still leaves a lot of people behind. And often the ones that it leaves behind are, are those that um, are not able to access the services for various reasons. And often those are families of color. So really to think about that as part of your building back better, restoring the system making the cuts you have to make, but doing it in a way that, that does less harm than otherwise would be, might happen. Mariko, why don't we turn to you next? Yeah, I think definitely making a stronger case for increased funding, um, public funding for early learning is really important and reinforcing that we, we are operating in a broken system. The system was broken before the pandemic. Um, so we definitely need increased funding as well as looking at the existing system and rethinking the existing system. Uh, we saw, for example, the subsidy system very quickly was able to pivot and adapt and um, pay based on enrollment versus attendance. That small tweak to the existing system had a significant impact for programs and families served. And so I think we're just looking at, looking at both bringing new money into the system and being bold enough to reduce the burden of the current system and rethink many of the components of the current system. I think we're gonna to have to tweak the current system as well as um, build a better system. Because I think there are some, there are opportunities in the existing system that we can still challenge. Great. And Megan, we'll, we'll turn to you last and I'm gonna throw one additional question in for you because it's a quick one. Um, that I don't know if you saw in the chat, but I was excited to see we have a, a participant on the line today from Zimbabwe um, who was asking whether the Bezos Foundation ever funded projects in Africa. So I'll let you answer that and then maybe reflect on that, that last question as well. Yeah, um, we are very, we're actually quite focused on uh, international expansion through our in-house programs, Room and Mind in the Making, uh, because of the need and the interest. We know we have a lot to learn, but really appreciate the question. Um, so that's something that we're working on. I'll say three things really quickly in, in closing. Um, we recognize that this is a time of economic constraint, but we have increased our grant making. Um, in response to COVID-19, and I'm so inspired by what my colleagues at the Ford Foundation are doing. I think it's really important uh, that we continue to support organizations um, and resist the temptation to shrink our grant-making budget. So that's one point. Um, second point, we have a renewed appreciation for the role of community foundations. While we don't have a place-based approach, uh, partnering with the Seattle Foundation to get emergency funding and support coordination um, among small businesses and family child care providers has been critical. We wouldn't be able to do that without the support of a community foundation that really brings an equity lens to the work. Um, and the third thing I would say is that we know so much about what enables young children and families to thrive, birth to five. I think there's a missing piece to that story, uh, and that is prenatal. Um, you know, children aren't necessarily born with equal opportunity because of what mothers are exposed to when they're expecting because of multi-generational trauma. But we also know there's an incredible capacity for resilience. Um, and so it's, just a, it's a part of the story that I think we need to complete. Um, and so as you talk about, and you ask about aspirations, I think completing that story is something that's really uh, gonna be important for us and everyone. Megan, thank you. And, and thanks to all three of our, our guest panelists today. It has been a real treat to have this conversation with you. And we so appreciate you all taking out the time, certainly for your ongoing support, but your support this afternoon as well. And um, know that we had a, a great conversation. If you want to, um, if you want to stick around for a couple minutes, if you, if time permitting, if you want to turn off your camera, even, um, you know, there's a, a, a good collection of, uh, of questions that maybe we could all kind of take a quick run out in the 
the in the chat. Did want if um, if we can bring up Brent. I don't know if we can uh, share those those graphics here, but did want to mention to you, we've got two additional webinars coming in the next couple of days that I want to definitely call your attention to. The first of those is on Thursday, the 18th, we'll be hosting the state uh, school superintendents from Utah, uh, Alaska, and Nevada. Um, uh, that'll be on the 18th at 3 p.m., I believe, 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and then the uh, next week, next Tuesday, uh, the 23rd, we will be hosting the lieutenant governors uh, from both Delaware and Louisiana. Uh, and that will be at, I believe, 1 p.m. Eastern time. So we would love to have you uh, join us for either or both of those conversations. You'll be able to access registration information for both of those events uh, through uh, our uh, social media accounts at Hunt underscore Institute on Twitter uh, is a great, uh, great place to, uh, to access that. And I will try uh, on my own account. I know um, I'm connected with, with many of you here. I'll try on my own account as well, uh, which is at Dan Worry uh, to uh, distribute those, those links as well. We plan to make this uh, philanthropic conversation a regular part of our uh, programming over the coming months here at the Institute. So be on the lookout for additional early childhood conversations with, uh, with philanthropy over the coming months. And uh, we should have an announcement on the next in the series very soon. But we're so grateful for all of you for taking the time to join us today and wish you all a wonderful afternoon. Thanks again, everyone.